Hey, you know, all right, so when we last left the Rocky franchise, of course, uh, Rocky had come back, defeated Apollo Creed, and is the new world heavyweight champion. So, again, seems like Rocky's story has come full circle. He lost in the first match, but gained his self-respect. Won this one, gained more self-respect. So it seems, again, like we have a good bookending series. And then, once again, as tends to happen, especially these days, the word comes down, we need another one. We want another. The audience still likes Rocky, and we need to see him back in the ring. So the question then becomes, what do you do once Rocky has overcome his demons, once he has fought back, won the impossible fight, and proven to the world, in the first one he proves to himself, but in the second one it's really making a statement to everybody that he is everything that he says he is. He's more than, a, than just a, a bum. So what do you do after that? Well, the, the answer is fairly simple, really. When you win a championship belt, any wrestler will tell you, the only guarantee that comes with winning that title is that eventually you're going to lose it. And the true mark of a great wrestler, I'm using wrestling as the example as opposed to boxing because I'm not knowledgeable about boxing. I am knowledgeable about wrestling. The true mark of how well a character and a performer have been established in the wrestling world comes not from when they win the title, but what happens to them after they lose it. Can they still function at a high level? Are they still a marquee draw? Um, is their name still worth something if they're not in that, that top spot? You take someone like, uh, you know, Bret Hart, who was an outstanding hero and villain and was always easy to plug into that main event. But when he wasn't in the main event, he was still having great matches with pretty much everybody they put him in there with. Meanwhile, you take people like, let's just say, Hulk Hogan, who was always a big star and always the, at the top of the card, but when he wasn't the champion, he was not able to settle into a mid-card role. You see? So, the question becomes, how good is your champion not when they won the title, but after they've lost it. And that becomes the basis, I think, for Rocky III. Um, so Rocky III is an interesting animal because I, I, I tend to think of Rocky III as the Goldfinger of the Rocky franchise. Goldfinger for when we finally get to doing the Bond movies, which is going to take a while. Um, Goldfinger is where all of the pieces finally fell into place and we got for the first time what would come to be thought of as the Bond formula. These are the things that need to be included in your Bond film, the beats it kind of has to go through, the individual elements, and Rocky III is really the bridge between where Rocky came from and where he is going to end up, at least for one more film. Um, we have kind of let the ultra-realistic, the gritty uh, aesthetic, we've left that behind. This film is solidly in the 80s. There is a, a gleam to it. Everything's got to shine. The colors are a lot brighter. Um, and everything feels... This is the first one that I would classify as an action movie. Though not with guns, but with, you know, with fists and whatnot. But I, I would classify this one more as an action movie rather than a drama like I would classify the first two. Um, again, we saw this kind of starting with Rocky II. We saw it kind of easing into it, but now we are fully there. And that's the look 
that is going to come to define the Rocky series. It's kind of interesting when you think that when I talk about defining the Rocky series, that's only for really two movies. But those movies were ingrained so much in the public consciousness that they've become kind of the definition for the series. We see the uh, the what will become as the Rocky formula and how these films are structured. It's funny that, you know, I kind of use wrestling as a metaphor to describe uh, the, the psychological makeup of this film as well as, you know, the fact that Hulk Hogan makes his big screen debut as Thunderlips in a cameo at the beginning, you know, and, uh, and we all know the heights that his film career flew off to after this film. Um, because this, this film's plot structure is a wrestling angle, like pure and simple. It is the purest, uh, purest wrestling angle. I'm surprised Vince McMahon doesn't get a writing credit on this. So Rocky's the champ. He is, uh, you know, he's beloved, you know, he's winning all of his fights and, you know, we're winning his fights, but he's not going up against anybody really tough. Mickey's protecting him, making sure he's not going off against anybody with a killer instinct. Um, but in the back is Clubber Lang, played by a soon-to-be household named Mr. T. And Clubber Lang is angry, he's dirty, he's, you know, he's a street fighter, and he is coming for Rocky. So at a big press conference where Rocky's cutting the promo, essentially, Clubber Lang comes out and cuts his promo, does everything, does everything but have his music hit before he comes out, but, you know, there he is, saying, you dodging me, I'm gonna fight you, basically goads Rocky into the fight, they have the fight, Rocky loses, Mr. T is the new champion, but all is not lost for our fallen hero as an old enemy in Apollo Creed comes to Rocky and says, I will train you. I forgot to mention Mickey dies uh, right before the fight, or right after the fight, I should say. Uh, but Apollo Creed comes and says, Stallion, what you got to do is get the eye of the tiger back, man. You gotta get the eye of the tiger. So he takes Rocky to LA to teach him how to fight uh, his way. Rocky comes back, beats Clever Lang, new champion, all of that. So again, like, like a wrestling angle. And this is going to be the formula that is going to follow the Rocky franchise uh, for the rest of its life. And again, it's only two movies that they use this formula, but it became so ingrained that it's what people consider the Rocky, you know, how a Rocky film is structured. Um, so here's the question that you have to ask. Is that formula, is it a bad formula? And the answer is no. It works perfectly well. One of the things I've discovered happily uh, upon re-watching these, these films and discussing them at length um, is that the Rocky franchise is fascinating because it seems like on the surface it's one thing. But when you really watch them, and especially if you're watching them back to back and watching the complete arc of the character, you see that they are not that surface thing. They're not just this flashy, you know, uh, 80s testosterone fest, that there's actually more going on here. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, in watching these films again and discussing them, the, the term that keeps coming up is toxic masculinity and how why Rocky is such a fascinating character is because he seems to be um, a, a character in a profession that would inspire toxic masculinity, and yet he renounces it. He is everything toxic masculinity is not. He is always a consistently good and good-hearted person, and he doesn't make decisions out of vengeance or out of, uh, you know, you know, ego. And when they do, when he does do that, for, for instance, he takes he takes the challenge of Clubber Lang because yeah, on the surface, because Clubber Lang comes out and calls him out. And in the heat of the moment, Rocky goes, yeah, I'll fight you, I'll fight you, you know, and blah, blah, blah. 
but then he takes the fight because he finds out that Mick has been coddling him, basically, and has been, you know, not putting him in there against uh, stronger opponents. So his true motivation is not ego. It's what it's always been, to test himself, to prove himself. When he loses, the motivation to go back and have the rematch is not vengeance. It's the desire to say, if I'm going to lose, I want to lose going at it full force. I want to know I gave it my best. Same thing that was a, that was his driving motivation in the first one. I want to know I gave it everything I got. And if I lose, I can still say, hey, I did, I did everything I possibly could do. He feels like when he lost the first time that he, he'd lost uh, that drive, and we see that throughout the film. He's given a little bit. He's he's a little bit more Apollo Creedish uh, in the early goings. Um, you know, doing a lot of advertisements. You know, do you know you know doing charity fights with wrestlers when he's training. He has all these people. You know, taking pictures in this flashy gym, and Mick is yelling at him, and he realizes that he's kind of let himself go soft. I also think one of the the clever little things, we don't get a lot of it in here, but I think the clever thing is uh, the introduction of Clubber Lang as the new antagonist. We see, here's another thing we start to see um, going forward, and again, I think that's become the staple of the Rocky franchise. Um, it kind of started with Apollo Creed, but Apollo Creed had the, the advantage of several films to grow and add facets to his personality. Clever Lang doesn't get that. Um, as we start to see the advent of these very cartoonish bad guys, you know, his his opponent in this one is no longer someone that we can understand. It's just a bad guy. But he's still a bad guy with a, an important narrative drive. Um, Clever Lang, the way I like to think of it is Clever Lang is the faith to Rocky's Buffy. He is what Rocky could have been. He's a street fighter. He comes from nothing. When we see him training, it's in these, it's in a basement. He's not using all this fancy equipment. You know, the things that Rocky had done in the previous films. But the difference is, is that he's a bully. He's, uh, he's dirty. He's angry. He's everything that Rocky wasn't but he's everything Rocky could have been if he, if the situation was a little different. So he, again, this is not a theme that's brought up um, a lot in the film, but it's there to say this is what he could have been had he not just been a better person, had he not, you know, just had that good fortune of, you know, being the good person that he is. We got to say that this is, of course, the the film that introduced the world to the pop culture icon that is Mr. T. And he is just awesome in this. He is so good. What's, so, what's funny about this is that Mr. T's uh, public image and the brand of Mr. T as it would become in the 80s is so far from the character he plays here. Yes, we all know him from the, for the gold jewelry and, you know, things like the A-Team and, you know, I remember the cartoon uh, from when I was a kid where he teamed up with a bunch of teenage gymnasts for some reason to fight crime. You know, but it was his, Mr. T, his cereal. I remember Mr. T's cereal. Uh, but his brand was always very uh, family-friendly, kid-friendly. You know, he was very, uh, you could tell he was very dedicated to kids. I mean, this is the guy who would team up with Hulk Hogan at the first WrestleMania to fight that evil Roddy Piper um, and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. Um, but here he is such a mean character and such a, you know, so bad. And I gotta believe, I have no proof of this, but in just a lot of his scenes, especially, I'm gonna call them his promos because that's exactly what they are. Uh, I feel like for a lot of his promos, I get the feeling Sly Stallone just told him, here's what kind of like a, a Christopher Guest movie said, here's the information we need to get across and you 
just be you because I can't I can't imagine Sylvester Stallone sitting down and writing these exact words for Mr. T. I, I get the feeling they just kind of let Mr. T be Mr. T. And I think if that's true, then it's either A, that's true and that's brilliant because Mr. T's natural charisma and just natural uh, ability to talk, you know, comes out. And if it's not, then Sylvester Stallone's an even better screenwriter and director than anyone could give him credit for. Because he, you know, he invented the Mr. T persona. I mean, this even has the famous, I pity the fool. Now, an interesting conversation point that came up when I was watching this film is, even though I don't think, well, this one, I, I think you can bring it up. Because I think race is a, uh, a subtext, not so much a subtext in this movie, but it's a subplot. Um, when Apollo Creed comes to teach Rocky, he takes him back to L.A. and takes him to a, a, a black gym. And, of course, Pauly, being the racist bigot that Pauly is, is, of course, being an asshole about it. Um, which is interesting because Rocky has never been a racist. Um, so with race being a driving force, a subtext, and a subplot in the movie, the question of race comes up when you look at the two prominent black uh, figures in the Rocky uh, universe up to this point, you have Apollo Creed and you have Clever Lang, and the question kind of comes up, you know, how do how do black audiences relate or feel about these two characters? If you're out there, if I have any African American black viewers, and you have a, you know, you have an insight on this, please share it. I would I'd be very interested to hear because I can only go off my assumptions, and of course that's coming from a you know a white male perspective. Um, because, yeah, the question comes up is, who do you think, do they like either of them? You know, are they both, do they feel they're both caricatures? You know, because they are two diametrically opposed characters. You have Clever Lang, who would be a lot more, I guess, what we would consider straight. Um, and Apollo Creed, who, you know, uh, I don't know how to say it. You know, I don't want to use any racial slurs here. But, you know, the, some people might consider him a bit of a traitor. He dresses nice. He speaks uh, a little bit more. Uh, clearly, so how do you feel about those characters? My view on it, if I, as I would think that Apollo Creed would still be the character. You might like Clever Lang, because sometimes you like the villains. And I like Clever Lang. I think Clever Lang is cool. Um, but I think Apollo Creed is still a good character and a good, a good piece of representation because he's a self-made man. He's a man who made himself everything he is, all the money he has, the good, the, the nice suits he wears. Um, it's very clear in the first couple Rockies that he is not just a boxer, he's a promoter, that he's promoting these fights. You know, so he's not letting someone else jip him out of the money. Sorry, I, that, that's a terrible phrase. Uh, cheat him out of the money. He's making that money on his own with his own intelligence. Um, so... Yeah, and I, I, I love that these movies let Carl Weathers kind of grow as a character, going from a more antagonistic opponent to a friend to, uh, to Rocky. I think that, that that's something that a lot of movies wouldn't do, but I like that he gets that chance to grow and become a, uh, a more beloved part of the franchise than just here is the opponent. Um... I guess the, the other thing I got you got to say about this one is, um, uh, again, watching these movies so close, I think that pop culture and pop culture memory has not been entirely fair to the character of Adrian. The, the character has, again, been kind of uh, saddled with this persona of the nagging wife. You know, the joke being that her role in every movie is to go, You're never going to win, Rock! You know, if, you, if you've seen that movie, uh, Walk Hard, uh, the Dewey Cox story with John C. Riley, she's basically like his first wife. I love you, baby. You're never going to make it. You know? Oh, Dewey, I do believe in you. I just know you're going to fail. You know, that's kind of what Adrian's character has been saddled with. And the, the popular perception of her. And I, I don't believe 
that that is true. I think she she is very supportive of him in this. She knows he's got to go back in. She encourages him to go in there and fight the guy. But she makes him, you know, admit why he's actually doing it, admit to himself that he's afraid, um, not just of Clubber Lang, but of, you know, the truth that, you know, I, I never had it, I didn't deserve it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I feel like the problem is, um, and I, I, I hate to say this, I'm trying not to be mean here, but I just don't think she's that good of an actor. I think she did an excellent job with the kind of meek, quiet Adrian we see in the first one, and then with a little bit more she's given, given to the second one. But as she's called upon to give these bigger speeches and become a, a much more involved uh, participant in the events, I don't think she's got the acting chop. She delivers her lines very passionately, but all of her lines come out in this shrieky, you know, shrewish kind of way. You know, you don't necessarily hear the sympathy in the in the lines or the understanding. You just hear that, and I think that has gone a bit of a way to kind of soiling her reputation a little bit as a character because she is a fantastic character. She is one of the best, fem not just female characters. I think that's that's putting a, a, a bizarre qualifier, qualifier on it. She's one of the best characters in cinema. And one of the best, definitely one of the best in any kind of sports movies. You know, I think she's a fairly accurate portrayal of an athlete's wife, especially one in a contact sport like he is. Um, uh, a couple other things this movie does that, you know, would become kind of uh, emblematic of the Rocky, uh, the Rocky franchise. Of course, you know, our training montages are finally here. Not just our training montages, but with, you know, upbeat rock music and, of course, the Rocky theme, which they had done in the first two. But this time it is really amped up. You wonder why Sylvester Stallone never directed music videos. Because his later Rocky films have a definite music video um, kind of feel to them. You know? Uh, I mean, he's got some of these training montages, as we'll see later, you know, they're almost like Baywatch montages, you know? um, so the the training montage really comes into prominence here. Another thing, how could you forget this? Oh, how could you forget it? the fucking soundtrack begins to become a character in the movie. Of course, in the first two, you have the classic da 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 go for an eight mile run. Um, but now the fucking power ballad, the power anthem is coming into it. Eye of the fucking tiger, baby. Is there any more eighties song than eye of the tiger? And I do not say that as a diss. I do not say that as an insult. It's a fucking eighties song. It is. That song is the fucking eighties. And that's another one that it's impossible to hear and not just go, I am the tiger, it's the thrill of the fight. I think it's impossible to not want to get up and move. If you're having trouble, let me give you a little piece of advice. If you're having trouble getting your, your energy up, you know, for your workout, especially in these times, slap on a Rocky soundtrack. Any of them, but anything from three onward. And let me tell you, that is going to give you that little extra boost. You got to get over that hump. You got to finish out that workout strong. Slap on Eye of the Tiger. And you and you, that that's all you need. You just need Eye of the Tiger. That's all. Um, so, yeah, we have definitely come... It's interesting watching these first three and seeing the transition. We go from gritty, we go to kind of in between, and then we go to pure 80s action. But the thing about it is, is that the Rocky movies are still high quality. The character stories and the arcs are logical. They make sense. Um, we've gotten a little bit more of a gloss on it, a little bit more of an 80s shine. We've, you know, like I say, we've completely come out of the, the 70s and into the 80s with the aesthetic. Um, but I think that that fits it a little bit. I think that fits the the 
the time period. It fits the, the stories that are being told. Rocky, though he is no longer grounded in gritty realism, is still a relatable hero with uh, real emotions and a real drive for what he does. There's still something that audiences can relate to. The Rocky franchise is still credible. But that is not going to be the case for much longer. Any series that goes for this long, especially a series that is not a planned series, where they are just coming up with a new thing every other year, um, eventually is going to, as the saying is, is going to jump the shark. And what would follow would be one of the most mocked, one of the most glaring changes, and one of the most beloved films in any franchise ever. So when next we talk, it's time to talk about the big one. It's time for Rocky IV. So until next time, thank you for joining me. And as always, yo Adrian, drive safe, and I will see you at the movies.